The next speaker is Maria Rodriguez Martinez. She's a physicist by training, but then transitioned to computational biology and is now a research scientist at IBM in Zurich, where she's also a group leader of the computational systems biology group. Besides this, she's also uh, the coordinator in two other Horizon 2020 projects, so she's somehow used to this kind of setting. And her research is focused on developing um, predictive models for personalized medicine, mainly for in cancer. And she's doing this through machine and deep learning. So stage is yours. Thank you very much, Nico. And yes, so this, uh, I think I'm opening the section of machine learning, deep learning. So I'm not going to get, I understand this, uh, this is not the, uh, the, the focus of this uh, ITN network. So I'm not going to get super technical, but if at some point you don't understand, just by all means stop me and we can discuss it. So I hope that should be an interactive discussion. Okay, so as, as Nico said, I work at IBM Research. Um, there I arrived around eight years ago and I founded the team of computational systems biology. And from the beginning, the goal of our research has been to develop personalized modeling, model approaches for cancer, uh, personalized medicine. And I, I took this, this cartoon uh, from one of our early grants that uh, I was coordinated. It was an H2020 grant that was focused on prostate cancer. And I took this cartoon because it did really straight the focus, the circle of what I underst we understood is personalized medicine. So the idea that we start with the patient when the patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, of course, this patient goes to the clinic and the oncology is going to extract some samples and perform some analysis. And the first thing being prostate cancer, maybe we want to characterize uh, the clonal heterogeneity, the special heterogeneity, how different clones structure the structure, the architecture of this tumor. We might also want to reconstruct, and we heard a few talks this morning in different cancer contexts, in the cancer context, but we also might want to reconstruct the, the, the tree of phylogenetic evolutions and understand how this tumor, this particular patient, evolved to have this cancer. But ultimately, what we want to do is just to predict, to give some insight to this patient. And typically by insight, that means that we want to give a therapy, a therapeutic approach that is personalized for this patient. So this typically, at least the way we have approaches, is to develop some molecular models that are particularized for the genetic or uh, proteomic alteration that this patient might harbor. And we do it in such a way that we predict the optimal intervention for this patient. And of course, we want to do everything available through a, a graphical interface or user-friendly interfaces, so both the patient and the clinician can have access to these uh, insights. So it's a little bit the good, the circular and illustrate a little bit what we are doing and what I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be talking about in this talk. But being more specific, I would like to tell you two stories of some research we have been done in recent years where both of them are based on deep learning. We are also doing other things, but here, because it's the deep learning block, I'm going to be focused on these two projects. The first one, I'm going to tell you what we have been doing to develop uh, drug models. And when I talk about modeling drugs, I mean two different things. The first one is just predicting uh, the sensitivity of a particular compound for a particular transcriptomic profile, I mean a patient. And the second one, I will also tell you things, we, work we have done to design, uh, to enhance the pipeline of early drug design. And then I will tell you what we have done, even more recent work, the, the work we have been doing to, to model uh, T cell based immunotherapies. I will also mention that through all this talk, um, you will be hearing about interpretability that probably you have heard when people talk about deep learning. So, one of the problems with deep learning is sure, if you have sufficient data, uh, you can train models that perform really well, and you can have breakthrough performance like alpha four. But the problem, the challenge with many of these models is they are typically black boxes. So you have very little insight about how the model makes the decision. And this is dangerous in biology because first of all, there could be bugs in the model. I mean, when you're developing, this is the most common thing that you have plenty of bugs. But even if your model is perfect, there could be data biases. Something simple that like you have trained your model on a cohort of Caucasian patients and then you apply it to an Asian cohort. So this type of data biases, sometimes they are not so obvious to identify, but it's important to have some insight about the, what the model is doing to identify them and correct them. So you will hear, uh, we are doing, this is an, an area we are quite actively working in. I want to be tell you a few of the things we have done in this, in, this, in this topic, and I'm happy to discuss more if you are interested. Okay, so with that, let's get started on the first, so I say the first part where I will tell you about the work we have done to, on, to, to, develop, to develop models for personalized drugs, uh, at the starting drug design. 
Okay, so I will start with Pac-Man model. So this is what we're starting with this, with this model. We were interested in something not too complicated. So we wanted to predict the sensitivity of a particular compound on a given cell line. And that's what we call it Pac-Man, because we were inspired by the video games in the 80s, where you have like, a, well, you remember the video games. So the idea was the cell line will be given this compound, and then we want to predict what happens. So in more technical terms, basically what we want to do is just to develop a deep learning architecture that can predict the sensitivity of an anti-cancer compound. And sensitivity, in other in more technical terms, is the IC50 values. that tell you how many cells will be killed at a particular concentration of this drug. So what was a bit more particular of what we wanted in mind is that instead of just taking one type of data, some other groups have done, we wanted to integrate the diverse data types because as we think, well, many other people, probably many people in this audience agree, typically you get the most um, um, uh, predictive power when you combine the diverse data types. So part more particularly here, we're thinking well, about including information, chemical information about the compound this can be typically small compounds can be represent, represented as a smile representation, which is, is uh, if you have never heard about the smiles, it's just a string of characters that describes the chemical structure of the compound. So that was one of the inputs of the model. The second one, of course, we want some measurements of the gene expression profiles of these cells. This could be transcriptomic profiles or proteomics, but something that tells you about the, phenomen the molecular phenotype of this cell line. And the last thing is prior knowledge. And, and this is a very important factor because one of the problems we have to develop deep learning models in biology is that typically we don't have large enough, large enough data sets to train things brute force. So you have to develop uh, models where you carefully exploit all the information you know about your system to just constrain the span of solutions. So here, when we talk about prior knowledge in particular, we use two different types of prior knowledge. So first, we use information about the connectivity between the cell lines, so which protein talks to each other protein. And also, we, took, we, we exploited information about particular, uh, the known drug targets of the compounds we wanted to model. OK, so this was our three, three pillars of information. And then what we ask our model to predict were two different things. The first one, as I said, the IC50 values. And the, same one, the second one, it was, as I said, in the, on the area of interpretability. We ask our model to give us insights about the more important chemical structure and genetic patterns that were the model used to make a prediction. Okay, and I will show you results in both directions. Okay, but first about sensitivity. So, um, well, the model, just a short, long story short, so the Pac-Man performed quite well. So one way you can measure the accuracy of the model is for this type of plot. So in the x-axis, you have the IC50 values predicted by Pac-Man on logarithmic scale. And in the y-axis, you have experimentally measured values. And you will have a perfect model, so all points will lie in, diagon in the diagonal. By the way, here the points, each point will be a combination of a cell line and a compound. So for each pair, you will have an IC50 value. So you have both the measure and the predicted. So as I said, if the model is perfect, all points will be in the diagonal. So just by measuring how much you deviate from the diagonal, you can see, you can measure how well or how bad, or how bad your model performs. So as you can see, well, it's already visually obvious that the model performs quite well. May I ask a question? Yeah. So is this, was the, um, the test and the train data, it including the drug and um, cell line pairs? Or did you, uh, as a test, set, um, separate uh, for example, the drugs completely or cell lines completely? So we did different setups. That's, that's a very good question. So we did different setups. We have like a Delenian setup in which you only separate the cell lines. For the cell lines, we have more data points. But then compounds can be shared in both the training and the data set. And they are in the training and in the validation uh, data set. But we also have the street setup in which you have the pairs, are the, 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 both the cell lines and the compounds in the training set will not be in the validation setup. So we wanted to make sure that the model is somehow, not, there's no data leakage. So we were... And this will work this provision? Okay, so I think this is for the strict setup, but probably we should double check the, 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 the paper. But I believe it's probably the strict setup. So we're doing well in, bo in both setups. We have to double check to which uh, uh, setup this, the, the figure corresponds. And Marie, this is uh, CCLE data or which cell line? Yeah. So here we use both. Uh, first, we train on the GDSC because this is the largest. Uh, when we were doing this work, it was in 2019. That was the largest. 
but then we also use the CCLE. And of course, we have problems because um, it's not so easy to match data set. They have uh, biases, uh, and we try first to correct, but even through correction, there are some experimental biases that cannot be overcome. So eventually, what we did is just training one after another. So first, you train your model on the GDSC, and then you also train on the, on the CCLE. And then you hope that the hope is that the model somehow will learn that each data set will have its biases, but somehow can pick up the signal. And this is also what turned out to be that the model can somehow pick up the important signal and discard the experimental variance. OK, and, and the last thing I would like to mention, there was also this in this other paper in 2020 that was an independent benchmark. Uh, has not, was, should you? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so uh, these neural networks, they, they, they act as something like as a matrix or as numbers. So how do you? Uh, convert the, yeah. the drug structure, the chemical structure, into a format that, uh, uh, that the neural networks can analyze something. How do you make it a structure, data structure? Yes, so this is doing through uh, learned embeddings. So it's going to be a bit more technical. So basically, the model had, it was, had two different pillars. On one hand, you have the transcriptomic profiles, which in the end we restricted ourselves to 2,000 genes used, used, used based on prior knowledge. So this part was easy to encode because you already have numbers. And then you have the second pillar in which you have uh, the, chemical, the chemical compounds. So the chemical structure, we encoded it as a smile representation. So that means that each has is a collection of, a string, of character, string characters. You could have the letters of atoms or some other symbols. So then you need some layers that will transform letters into numerical numbers. This is what calls the, uh, for example, this is what NLP does. It just NLP approaches will transform words or letters into numerical vectors that eventually the, the network can keep processing and combining. Yeah? Sorry, a follow up question. This is, the, the translation is based on word back, TDF, IDF. What kind of numerical transformation did you use for that? I think we just, no, we did not use any of this uh, word to back, no. We just were simply as a layer of embeddings that will transform each one of the possible car characters in a, in a numerical representation. What did you use the NLP for? No, no, the NLP was just an analogy. So in NLP, you will do the same. You will have, uh, in, in NLP, you have a sentence. So each word needs to be transformed into a vector. So for. But you didn't do that for this? No, no, not in this model. No, not in this model. Um, no, not, not in this model. We did not do it. Any other question? Do you remember to what level you dropped actually when you used the different? So I'm not familiar with the two data sets. It's just that these acronyms. Um, to what level does it actually fall in the performance if you use if you use it on a different data set? Roughly, like just is it really dropping massively, or is it just like? I oh, know I don't remember. Sorry, I don't I don't remember there was a massive dropout. Um, certainly, it will be a small. I will expect a small decrease, but no, I don't remember the numbers. Sorry. And maybe one related question because IC50 is estimate itself, you know, from a kind of curve. Could you also, I mean, I mean, does it make sense to estimate that itself, like sort of the shape of the curve or something? Or? So this is independent. So what we took is these data sets, the GDSC and the CCLE. Of course, they have done this, what you said, this, this curve. They have this uh, different dilu dilu diluting curve where you are giving that, uh, the compound to your cell in a different concentration. And then you estimate the shift value from these curves. So in the end, these data sets, what they give you is just the, what we took is just the final data in which you just have the shift value. So we ignore the previous information. OK. OK, so this is about accuracy. Uh, okay. I'm happy to see so many questions. <laughs> OK, so let's move now to the topic of interpretability. So when we started developing this model, um, um, we were started thinking about the topic of interpretability, how interpretability could be achieved. I think, again, this, this has gained a lot of momentum. So by now, there are more sophisticated approaches. But at the time, we used one of the kind of simplest thing that you could think of. So we use attention mechanisms. So what is this? This is a module, so some, some special layers that you integrate in your model, and then you train your model as usual. And then once the model is trained, so each time you ask the model to make a prediction for a, part, for a particular cell line or compound, you can also get at the same time this type of heat map. So for instance, here you can see this compound, the darker the color is, that means that the model paid more attention to this particular feature. So this. Uh, so for this particular, these two particular drugs. 
So this is qualitative, but it allows you to make some type of inf qualitative inference. So for instance, these two drugs, so one is macitinib, the other one is imatinib, they are both FDA approved drugs for the treatment of leukemia. And as you can see, they are almost identical. The only difference is the atom, I don't know, in the one, that the, one of the atoms in, in, the, in the ring that is circle, in one case is you have a sulfur, the other one you have a nitrogen. And because of this change, macitinib has a slightly better IC50 value. So for IC50 values, lower means, slightly, slightly, means better uh, sensitivity. So when you look at the attention maps of both compounds, you can see that in the case of macitinib, most of the attention is focused on this atom, on the sulfur, while the other, com the other atoms get lower attention scores. However, when you look at imatinib, the one on the right, you see that um, the, the, there was not a winning attention pattern. So there are different atoms, different patterns that get attention, moderate attention, but this, this has, doesn't seem to be a winning pattern. So by comparing these two compounds, you can maybe create a, a, a generate a hypothesis that this atom, the sulfur, is the one that gives uh, macetinib the slightly better uh, sensitivity value. And of course, based on this type of hypothesis, you could just generate other hypotheses, like what happened when we further modify it, and then you could say something that you could eventually validate experimentally. So as I said, this is, uh, at this point, still qualitative, but just give you some understanding of what the model is looking at. Okay, so in case uh, you would like to play with this model, so we have created a web service. It's, it's free to use, so you don't even need to create a, to make a login. And uh, you go to this, this uh, web page over there, or, or if you forget about it, just come go to our web page in IBM uh, Zurich uh, Computational Biology, and then you can navigate through the software web page. And then you can, through this web, web service, you can um, generate, introduce the uh, chemical structure of your preferred uh, FDA, uh, FDA compound. No, not even FDA compound. You can introduce the chemical structure of your own compound, or you can even design your own compound, because we have a molecular editor that allows, allows you to, it, to design it. And one quick question. <clears throat> uh, maybe you said that I missed it. But you're not in considering as information the putative target of the drug. It is used. So when <laughs> so it was it was used to just to select the genes. So the problem what we have is like we cannot just generate a deep learning model using twenty thousand genes because we don't have enough data to train. So we have to sub sub select a subset of genes, and we did we selected two thousand, and we did that based on the known drug targets of each compound, and then use, using a network of molecular interaction, we have this uh, technique to spread perturbations around the neighbors. Mm -hmm and select the first neighbor of each drug target. So the information of the drug targets is used, but in an indirect way. Okay. And so your comment was that because we don't get the targets of? No, I was surprised that I, I, don't, I don't know the molecular structure of the two drugs, but mazitinib but imatinib are very different targets. But that's why I was a little bit surprised to see them side by side as I compared them. Yeah. Okay. Well, but also keep in mind that sure, maybe the, 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 the putative targets are different, but there's also a lot of uh, papers that have reported that very often like the, the established drug targets of expected compounds are not the real targets. So, oh, sure. <laughs> and the Okay, and, and also this, through this web service, you can also get information about the attention mechanisms, so the, the attention maps. So here you can see, uh, this is the attention map I got. Uh, uh, so this is the, for the chemical structure that I discussed before. And similarly, you can do the same exercise for the gene maps. So you can also ask the model to tell you which genes were more informative to make a prediction. Okay, so you happen to be ha working on this problem and you want to play with the survey, just let us know how it goes. And we're always happy to hear. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move to the, uh, the second model that we developed to this, to based on Pac-Man, but we wanted to enhance Pac-Man to address the problem of drug design, which is much harder. So here, what we decided to do is to use reinforcement, we call it RL, from reinforcement learning, and I will give you a super brief um, uh, crash course of what reinforcement learning is. But maybe, but maybe best, I will give you a very brief introduction about why we care about, um, about using deep learning for drug design. So I find these numbers quite telling by themselves. So we are today spending uh, more than 100-fold times the amount of money spent in the 50s to develop new compounds. And yet, compounds developed today are more likely to fail in clinical trials than in the 50s. 
And this is despite the much, more, the, the much higher amount of data about molecular interactions, about drug screenings, about uh, chemical compounds that we have today. So that is really surprising. We have much more data, we spend more money, and yet compounds developed today are more likely to fail. So something seems not to be failing in the way we are approaching drug design. And the, 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 the hypothesis we had is that maybe we are not exploiting the data in a systematic manner. So to explore how we could do this in a more systematic manner, we wanted to uh, take the use reinforcement learning, which probably um, is a very hot topic in deep learning these days. So reinforcement learning, I'm sure you have heard about it. For instance, it was the approach that we used to train AlphaGo, that is the machine that was trained to, to beat the human champion at Go. And it has also been trained to, to play these video games, uh, like to, play the, to beat humans at playing Super Mario Bros. and many other games. So as you can see, it can achieve very complex tasks, and it learns in an iterative manner. So how does it work? So the basic idea is very simple. In a reinforcement learning uh, problem, you will have two components, basic an agent and an environment. So an agent is something, so coming back to the example of Super Mario Bros, the agent will be Super Mario. So at each iteration, it's doing something, just opening a door or uh, jumping or, or throwing a stone. And each time you do something on the environment, the environment is the rest of the video game, you get a reward. You get a positive or negative reward, depending on whether this action takes you closer or farther from your goal. And then you keep iterating. And the idea is that you, through enough iteration, you, might convert, you, you hope to converge to your goal, uh, to, to, to your learning goal. OK, so how do we apply this to learn drugs, so to design new drugs? So here. What we thought about is like the aging will be any model, any deep learning model that can design new compounds or something that resembles a compound. This is not a super difficult task. It's not trivial, but it's not super difficult because by now we have large databases of bioactive compounds with millions of examples. So it's not difficult to train a generative model, which is just simply a deep learning model that learns how a bioactive compounds looks like and designs something similar. So that will be the agent. Now, we need an environment, um, but before defining the environment, we need to design what are our goals. So our goals are to define uh, compounds with good sensitivity and low toxicity. So according to that, our environment, well, we also call it critic. Our environment, our critic, will be a model that predicts for every, every, any given compound designed in each iteration. It will tell us what is the AC50 value of this compound and give us a toxicity score for this compound. And of course, the, the IC50 prediction is, is done with Pac-Man, the model I presented before. And the toxicity, well, we also develop a site model that also predicts to toxicity. So these are models that you can develop, and then you add them to your iterative process. And that's it. Then you iterate over many times, and the idea is that you eventually design something that you hope has the right properties. So maybe skip this. So let me show you some results. So here in this paper, what we did is just taking, again, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, we, we choose some cancer cell lines as, as yes? Uh, so uh, in the environment, do you have pre predefined states or something that uh, the model will automatically simulate and learn from that? I, I did not understand your question. So we have some steps. Yes, so we have the agent and the environment. Yeah. So, uh, based on the state in the environment, we are getting a reward. So, the environment, is it, do you have a database or something? Yeah, so, so maybe the, the, the word environment is confused. So, think of environment, let's think about Pac-Man, the model I presented before that will give you an IC50 value for each cell line and each compound. So, basically, in this approach, the one I presented before, so here you are setting, you are fixing your transcriptomic profile because the whole goal here is to design a compound for a particular transcriptomic profile. So your target profile, transcriptomic profile is fixed. Now at each iteration, you design a candidate compound, okay? And then you give that to the environment that for us is Pac-Man and this other module to predict toxicity. So Pac-Man has the two inputs it needs to make a prediction. It has a transcriptomic profile because it's something you have set from the beginning and it has the compound that has been generated by the agent in that iteration. So from that, Pac-Man will give you an IC50 value, and then well, if this is good, good, so the agent will just give you a positive reward. If it's bad, you just get a negative reward. 
and then you continue the iteration. So based on this reward, the, the agent designs another compound at the next iteration. A slightly similar, if the, 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 the feedback was good, so it would just tr tr uh, try things that are close to this compound to see whether you can further optimize, or if it was bad, you would have a large step and just sample something different on the space of possible compounds. Yeah, so, uh, so do we know a given drug structure is uh, toxic or something? So for this exactly, uh, no, in principle you don't know. So what we did is we used a toxicity data set that is quite used in the community, it's the TOX21. And, and there is a trick actually, because uh, I did not go into the details. So ideally what you would like to do is just to predict toxicity in humans, in different organs. At this point we don't have the data set. So what this TOX21 this tox uh, public data set is predict this is environmental toxicity. So still at this point it's not human based toxicity. But at least based on environmental toxicity, so these are the data set that allows you to, to predict, to train a model that predicts, given a particular compound, whether this is toxic or not. And then those that are toxic are discarded from the optimization. Yeah. A good question is actually the novel design, or is this like a way of going quickly through virtual libraries with predefined drugs? This is the novel design. So these compounds are non-existent. So this is impressive, because like when you suggest the molecule, you will have very, very sparse rewards, right? So whether you generate it atom by atom or this mass string, you can only evaluate the reward at the end. Do you try to encourage your model to learn something like in this mid time steps, or? Sorry, I didn't know. Can you refer to the question? How do you overcome like the sparsity of rewards then? Why? There's no sparsity of rewards. So the model, the, the, the agent can design basically what is trend is to generate a smile representation for a compound. And there's possible space of, the space of possible compounds is, is quite, is huge. So the, the, the agent is generating that. Then Pac-Man, the only thing it needs is a, is a smile representation. So once it has this input, you can generate a, 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 a IC50 value and a positive or negative reward. What you might be asking, I don't know if that's your question, so correct me if I'm wrong, you might be asking that you have no guarantees that the latent space is smooth. So, no. no. I, I will just, like, my question is, like, when you generate this mass strength, like, do you do it like character by character? Yeah. Yes, and so, when you, when you need to like, predict all of these characters, right, and you don't have any reward in the meantime to predict the next character, the reinforcement name is called like, you know, the sparsity reward. Ah, this but is what you mean. And you can get the reward. It's what you mean, that you have discrete changes. Y yes, and, yeah. it's, and it's really hard to like, predict the next character, the next atom, generate such molecules. It's like, very interesting that you train that. And I wonder, did you encourage your model to use like, partial rewards in a way, or...? We did not try that, so it's true. We are making just discrete changes at each iteration. Typically, we just change one character, but and, and there's no guarantee that the change in the reward will be small. Sometimes just changing up particular character will have a big change. But uh, um, mm, I don't know how else you could do it, to be honest. I will need to think about that. I don't know how else you could just uh, make sure that you have a small changes. In the end, yes, it's half a discrete space, but the same that you, you are doing, like in, in, in a different scenario, when you are doing MCMC sampling, you also are sampling different parameters, and sometimes there are discontinuous jumps from one set of parameters to another one. And sure, you can maybe enforce that, uh, yes, it's the jump from one point to another is small. Maybe you could try to do that. We have not done it here. Yeah, that's an interest, interesting comment. Uh, actually, I was working on the problem, Sorry. and this was really the problem I've been facing, so I just wonder if you... Are yeah, yeah, I know. So no, we did, not, we did not have this problem, so just the, the, iter the iteration converge. Sorry, there was a comment over there. Um, and the training data set that's used here, or the, the optimization criteria that you're using, it's still based on CCLE or, uh, and the SAMA data sets, or is it based on something like what's used to say, to reinforce it, like, so what's the correct yeah, answer yeah, yeah. that you've achieved, or is it based on clinical data, or, is it or what yeah. being used here to... So here, for, for the environment, the critique, you use the model Pac-Man that I introduced before. So this, was, this model was trained on the GDSC and the CCLE. So indirectly, the model knows about these data sets. For the toxicity, we use the TOX21 data set. And then for the agent, so we use, um, I think, uh, 
chem and, and, and DB, which is a database of media, and, and that was about it. So you don't need anything else because for the agent, the agent only cares about designing something that looks as a compound. At this point, the agent doesn't care whether it's a good or bad compound. That will come through optimization. So the agent just designs something that looks like a, something in this database. See? Okay. And the transcriptomic profile is that from bugs RNA sequencing of cell lines. Yeah, at this point we're working with cell lines, yes. Yes, and we are all using 2,000 genes per cell line, as I explained before, because it will be have been too difficult to use the full transcriptomic profile. Yeah, there is a question. Okay, so I have two questions. So I really, um, so there are two things. One, of the, one, one is, if I understand the main point of so there is a state space, and I understand that for you state space means molecules. Yeah. Okay, and there's a policy. Okay, and now about the state space. I think if you, like, if I remember the equations of this reinforcement learning, of, like what you actually try to optimize when you optimize the policy, you try to do like an expectation over the states of the next move mm -hmm. according to the policy. Mm -hmm. And now I don't see any way of actually doing this with this model because this model can generate you one molecule and you can reward it, but it's not that you don't make, or maybe you're like approximating this uh, expectation by sampling a finite number of, of these. Um, so okay, the, the, the question is, how do you approximate this uh, expectation over all the possible states that you can go to from the current uh, state, which is really many, right? So you could sample I understand that you're okay. This is probably like a variation of other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This part, yeah. You you can you can have an, actually inside of the latent space you have infinite number of of um, of points you can go to from the current point, and then it's very hard to evaluate this expectation because you have to use Pac-Man to give you this reward. So that's the first question. How do you approximate it? And then another thing is since this model you said actually does not learn the, the policy, if I understand correctly, you said it only learns this, this being a molecule, then where is this policy in this model? Okay, so uh, let me see if I remember. So first about the agent. So the agent is just, is, as you can see here, well, no, did not explain that, but as you can maybe see for the picture, it's just a simple, two simple autoencoders uh, coupled to each other. So, so the, model, the, the agent is just designing some, it just, the first one is an autocode and train on the transcriptomic profile. So this, we do it to encode information on the transcriptomic profile. But the, sec the part that is learning the compounds is the second autoencoder. Okay, so this is just a simple autoencoder that is just giving you an each iteration. It's giving you a sampling, a point in the latent space, generating a compound, okay? Now, when you go to the critique, what well, the critique, what it has to give you is actually, you have to predict what is the best next step. So this is the whole idea of the optimization. So here, what we are doing is simply trying to optimize the conditional expectation of having a positive reward for the next step. And as you do it, this you do it based on Pac-Man and, and the, 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 res, the response you got in this particular step and the previous, the previous responses of the preliminary steps. And in the end, you can estimate in a rough manner some conditional expectation that gives you what is the optimal step for the next iteration. It's not super rigorous math, it's not super sophisticated, but in all this uh, reinforcement learning setup, there are many rough approximations to make the, the policy or the kind of, uh, it's not a theoretical mathematical proof, but in practice, is that you have to do some approximations to just try to predict what is the optimal step. And in the end, so, so maybe I showed this plot, it was a little bit, so this is that you can see that as some type of Monte Carlo search in the space of possible compounds, but in the end, it might, that it might not be even, you, you don't want to have to be super exact about what is the next possible, the best possible direction in the next step. You just want to approximate it with enough accuracy so at least you are not walking in the opposite direction. But as long as you have the direction roughly okay, you will eventually converge. So you could converge faster or, or, or slower depending on how well is your policy. Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking that the question is excellent. I mean, I mean, how um, is there a guarantee that you will you will uh, you will improve 
the, I mean, uh, would you argue to the conditional expectation optimization? Is there a theoretical guarantee that you you will you will maximize, you will get a reward that is positive every time? There's no guarantee, right? As far as I know, if you want a mathematical proof telling you that you're going to, I don't think there is a theoretical proof. So these are also like a, a heuristic experiments in which there has been many settings has been demonstrated eventually you convert something that has the properties that you have imposed at the beginning. But I don't think there is a, a theoretical mathematical guarantee of that. Yeah. The, this transcriptomic profiles in these cases of the CCLE and the GDSC, these are of the untreated cell lines. And the untreated cell lines, the first component is always cell proliferation, basically the cell cycling of those cell lines. And that's a major dominant component in if you do any decomposition of those data. So I can imagine that it would be very, very easy to do incredibly well on anything that targets something related to the cell cycle. And then there's a whole class of drugs will be hidden from this. And have you taken away that first component? Sorry, I'm not sure to understand your, your comment about cell proliferation. So many of these cell lines do not even cycle, because they are cell lines. It, 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 it's, 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 I can give you references on that. It, 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 the first component in all okay. of these is, is always cell okay. proliferation, and it's always the fact that the doubling time okay. of these cells is different. And do, if you pull out the doubling time, you'll lose a lot of data in these cell line panels. Okay. So it's very easy to do well on a certain set of this data because of the, the doubling time is such a strong principal component. So I'd really like to see, like pulling that out, just take out the first, like do the decomposition of the, of the genes, take away the first component and then repeat it. Because if you can get past that, this is really, really exciting. But I think, I mean, I need to think about it, but I think that's really, this is not the point here. In the end, what you take from these drug screenings, from this GDSC and the CCLE, you just want the IC50 value. Yeah, the drug screen off. is different, but the, the cell, the gene expression data of the CCLE is, is just the plain untreated cell lines. And if you take the cell lines, if you just do the gene expression profiling of the cell lines without any treatment, without anything, cell doubling time is the first component on any of those analyses. So it's, it's actually one of these like quirky little things that it actually becomes an easy problem. But if you then remove that component, you actually find that the gene sets and everything you pull out is just really, really different. Okay. Okay, so we did not... I mean, have not heard about that, so it might be. We have not tested, so I don't know. It might be that uh, cell uh, doubling, uh, cell genes related to cell, cell replication are an important component on these transcriptomic profiles. We have not checked that. The other thing that we, like, have you looked at, like, say the Lynx 100 or the CMAP or any of these drug response kind of things as, as a check? Not with the Lynx one, uh, 1000, because uh, with the Lynx, the, the problem you have there, you only have 1000 measured genes, and also the, 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 uh, it's not single cell RNA, it's not RNA seq data, so it was already, we had a lot of trouble already putting together GDSC and CCLE, so you go to such a di different technology, would have been, we thought it was too much of a departure to just hope that the model will also integrate the data well. But it will be interesting in future separate work to look at it. Okay, any other, any other question? Okay, so I don't think I'm gonna be come to the second part, but that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can finish that part and the second we can discuss in the coffee break. Okay, so let me show you some result. Uh, so what we did is that we took four uh, different cell lines. Here I'm showing the result for breast cancer, but the other ones look pretty much the same. So let's look first at this plot, the one on the left. So here, well, first in the x-axis, we have the uh, IC50 values on logarithmic scale. So now basically the part on the right that is marking gray is the region of good IC50 values. And here I'm showing two different distributions. So first one, you have the gray distribution. That's a distribution of compounds designed by the uh, agent, the generative model, without the reinforcement learning optimization. So as you can see, without reinforcement learning, basically the compounds you are learning don't have particularly good IC50 values because most of the bulk of the distribution is in the part with not good IC50 values. 
Now, if you look at the red distribution, this is the one that had been further optimized through reinforcement learning, and then you can see that there's a significant shift towards the right part of the distribution. So that's a little bit, it's, it's an in silico proof, of course, it's not an experimental validation, but it's an in silico proof that actually this, this optimization is just increasing the AC50 values. And here also in the second and third middle plot, I'm showing some examples of compounds that we designed. And I'm comparing them to the one on the right is doxorubicin, which is a, a compound that is used, it's, it's, it's an existing compound used for the treatment of breast cancer. And I just show it for comparison. So I know this is super qualitative, but you can see that indeed, so they are different, but there are some patterns that tend to be similar. So the model somehow not inventing anything from scratch, but just mixing patterns that are already observed and creating new compounds. So the good thing is also, um, we also got good properties for other, proper, for other properties that uh, they are respective, uh, they, they, they are ideal to obtain in the pipeline of drug design. So for instance, you have the QED, which is a score to tell you how uh, drug-like a compound is, and also solubility, which is also important for uh, any therapeutic drug, or synthetic accessibility that tells you how easy or difficult it is to synthesize a drug. And we also got good predicted properties on these three, pro so we, with good uh, behavior on these three properties, and that was nice because we did not actually optimize for that. Actually, I was having a conversation last week about this, and somebody pointed out, and maybe they, they have a point, that it might be that the data set that we started the training, this uh, ChemDB, uh, already has this compound, this compound already biased toward having good properties in these three directions. So it could be that our setup, our optimization already inherits this bias in the data. But in any case, it's a good bias to have because we kind of inherit for free this uh, good behavior in these properties. Did you try to check how different they actually are from those the molecules to generate? Yes, we look at that. I don't have the plot here, but in the papers that we have, we, have, we plot a part of the space of uh, possible compounds, and we plot the ones that are existing. And uh, in a few cases, we just redesign things that are already existing. So it's not that we design all the time new things. What we found that, uh, like typically, the, the, the optimization, the design happens that if there is an existing compound, of course, the model is, is more confident about things that happen in the neighborhood of this existing compound. So new compounds with this behavior tend to happen close to things that are already new, known. And that makes sense because if you think about the space of all possible compounds, this is huge. I mean, I, I've seen numbers of 10 to the 120 possible, uh, possible compounds. So there's absolutely no way, at least at this point, that we can sample, we can learn this whole space. So I would not trust a prediction of the model in a space very far away from anything that is known, because basically at this point, the model is just really guessing and I would not trust any prediction from the model. So I think from, from, from this analysis, it seems that the predictions that have higher confidence are the ones that are in the neighborhood of things that are already existing. So I would see it more like improvement rather than completely uh, designed from scratch. Okay, so I don't think I'm gonna have time to go to the second part. So, oh, yeah. Experiment. So what we are discussing, but things that, that kind of this project got a bit, uh, uh, got stuck, so I don't know if we ever got to do it. So we want this actually to design, to synthesize some compounds. So the idea is that we do, then we have a collaborator uh, and, uh, in Germany who's working on hepatoblastoma. So he gave us a collection of cell lines and we designed compounds for these uh, hepatoblastoma cell lines. And the idea is that we wanted to synthesize them uh, in Zurich. So we have, uh, we also, there is also a lot of activities in automatic chemistry in the Zurich lab. So there's an automatic robot that can just design the retrosynthesis uh, route for this, to, to synthesize a particular compound and do the, the automatic syn th synthesis completely uh, in a completely automatic manner. So we wanted to use this robot to design the compounds and then ship them to Germany and test them uh, in these cell lines. Unfortunately, the project seems to be stuck, so I don't know, I hope that we can move it forward, but at this point we have not done it yet. Yeah, I don't think I should go to the second part, no, because it's going to be... <laughs> so let me just conclude, uh, go to the conclusions. Okay. So, well, I only saw you... <laughs> it's nice to have so many questions, but I show you that um, we have by now large data sets that uh, can give us a lot of rich information about uh, many of the biological processes that are important for cancer. 
but we need models to interpret this data, to, or at least to extract the most meaningful patterns from this data. And deep learning and machine learning is one of the approaches to do that, but of course, this has to be done in an interpretable manner. And here I only mention what we have done with attention mechanisms. We have done a lot of other work in my team to develop models specifically designed to interpret particular models. So this, I'm happy to discuss about that if you are interested. And then here I show you Pacman, which is uh, our proposed, uh, proposed model to uh, predict the drug sensitivity using multimodal data sets. And Pacman achieves interpretability using attention mechanisms. And then also we presented Pacman RL that has basically built some Pacman using reinforcement learning to uh, design particular uh, compounds targeted to particular transcriptomic profiles. And well, the part I did not show, it was I wanted to share the work we have done to also predict the binding of T-cell receptors. So uh, after this work on the drug models, we have become quite interested in model cancer immunotherapies, specifically T-cell-based therapies. So we have actually reused some of the Pac-Man models to predict the binding of T-cell receptors and epitopes. But then we can, we can discuss another time. So thank you for your attention. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Well, of course, the people who did the work, sorry. I, I have a question, maybe it's more general, and I, I'm not even sure whether it applies, but you mentioned AlphaFold, right? And right now, that generated thousands of new structures that can open up and give more possibilities about different targets. So, uh, and basically new possible mm, drug that, mm, drugs that can be designed. Would that affect your model? Is that these new structures or these new targets possible and that would open up these new possibilities would be some information that could be added to the model or something. So AlphaFold at least at this point is focused on proteins, not on compounds, although they are now so an extension in which are predicting the, the, com the complex, the binding between, between protein complex. So I think for the first part, I would not see so much the overlap, but for the second part, where I was, uh, you we are trying to develop models to predict the binding of T cell receptors and epitopes, so certainly having the structure of uh, when you want to predict uh, the binding of different proteins, alpha-fold can be useful to give you at least some canonical structures to begin with, to at least to give you from, if you want to go from sequence to predict the, the structure and try to predict the binding, alpha-fold might be the first step. Although, however, you have to be careful because alpha-fold, well, of course, it outperforms any other approach for the determination of crystallographical structure. But when you are talking about immunological proteins, as um, we are quite interested in modeling T-cell receptors, so T-cell receptors bind many different epitopes because they have a flexible loop that can adapt to the different chem 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 chemical properties of the different epitopes. So alpha-fold does not work well with flexible loops because, of course, flexible loops, by definition, they are flexible, so there's not a conformational structure that you can use. So I think alpha-fold can really help and kind of move forward many of these models to predict binding from sequence and from a structure, but still the, it's, it's not the ultimate response to everything. So some of that in some, in some problems, it might not work. Maybe Yeman can already set up his presentation, then we can take one more question, then we have to move on for okay. the sake of time. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, it's a bit general about personalized medicine and uh, with these AIs. So, uh, always we, we train our models based on the knowledge, like our ground truth is uh, like the human-based uh, uh, target results. And uh, if we are training the model with what we know, how can we expect something, you know, something new? And secondly, if when we get something new, and if we cannot interpret it, that means we don't interpret it, means we don't know that, and we don't want to accept it as well. So how can this uh, help us in the future? So your first question, if I understood, is just how we can learn about something we don't know yet using machine learning, deep learning. Y yes. Well, uh, let me give you a counter example. Suppose that you know that some process is linear. The input and the output has a linear relationship. And I give you the input, the, the uh, point, data point here and data point here. And you know there's a linear relationship. So you can also learn about what is in between because you know it's linear. And, but in principle, you have inferred the behavior in the middle because you have some information about what is the expected behavior. 
So I think the same in a bit more sophisticated setting can be done in machine learning, deep learning. So of course you only have some data points, but you can make reasonable spec inferences about the, maybe expecting that the latent space have a smoothness from one point to another. There is no guarantee that it works because this is not a linear problem and if some, some problems might have some non-smooth behaviors and you can have these continuous jumps and things can go wrong, but you can always test the accuracy of your model. And in most cases, this assumption that the latent space is smooth, so you can do inference, at least in a neighborhood, it seems to be valid. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>